Hello, all my friends in Chile. This is World Entrepreneurship Week, uh, November 2011, and I'm delighted to be a part of your events in conjunction with TEDx Patagonia in Santiago. I wish I could be there in person with you. I can't. I'm here in Austin, Texas. I'll do the best I can from here. What I thought I'd talk about for a few minutes today is what is entrepreneurship? There are a lot of definitions out there. People write books, academics do research. Most of the great entrepreneurs I meet with don't spend that much time thinking about entrepreneurship. They're so busy doing it that I step back and look at it. I've been blessed in that I've been a student of business since I was a little kid. I started reading business magazines and studying companies when I was 12 years old. I know it sounds crazy, but what can I say? Anyhow, and so I've been a student almost a scholar of business my whole life, which has been a lot of years now, 50 years of reading business magazines. And I've also been an entrepreneur. I've started, depending on how you count, if you count the ones I started in college, about eight companies ended up creating tens of thousands of jobs. The uh, investors made uh, over $100 million on the ideas. I raised maybe 40, 50 million for my different concepts at different stages. I've had successes, I've had failures. So I've had the chance to look at all this from both the perspective of kind of the research and from the person really living and doing it. And as I've looked at it, well, let me start out by talking about what entrepreneurship is not. So I was entrepreneur in residence at the McCombs Business School at the University of Texas here in Austin two years ago. I was the first one they had. They have a new one every year. They're on number three now, but I was the first one. They gave me an office, and we put up signs all over campus saying, if you got a business idea, go see Gary Hoover. And uh, I saw students from physics and chemistry, computer science, engineering, business, law, liberal arts, philosophy, graduate students, undergraduates, all sorts of people. Over 200 students I met an hour each with. One of the things, people come knock on my door and say, I want to see the entrepreneur in residence. I say, that's me. Come on in. And, and they come in. And I say, well, why do you want to see the entrepreneur in residence? Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? And they say, because I want to be rich. And I'd say, you're in a wrong office. You need to look somewhere else. People who come at it from that mindset, I want to get rich, they're usually looking for an easy formula. Like, oh, if I do A and I do B and I get good grades in C, uh, class E, then... D will happen. They're looking for an algorithm. They're looking for this logical flow. They're looking for some guarantee of the outcomes, the results. That ain't happening in entrepreneurship. All you can do is find something you love doing that people need and throw yourself at it. If, if all you really want to do in life is to be rich, then go practice law, go practice medicine, become a residential real estate broker in an affluent neighborhood. There are a lot of easier ways to become rich than by trying to start an enterprise. The other thing, if you study the history of great entrepreneurs, you'll see that they very rarely we're in it in the pursuit of money. Once in a while you'll see that, but it is so rare. When you study the greatest of the greats, you know, Bill Gates never thought he'd be rich. He just liked programming and playing with all that stuff. And Steve Jobs, obviously, was on his own trip. So it's not about money. That doesn't mean money doesn't matter at times. Doesn't mean you don't need capital for certain businesses at certain stages of their evolution. I mean, as far as big capital, I always use some capital, but I, I have a list of 190 business ideas. Some of them take $500, some of them take 500 million. So so it depends on the idea. But it's not fundamentally about money. The next thing, especially here in Austin, our whole technology environment, a high-tech city, Dell computers, and on and on. And I get students come in, they think it's about technology. They come into my office with their cool gadget they've invented, or a piece of software, a little routine, a Java applet, whatever. And they're like, oh, I've invented this amazing thing, and I can't show it to you. It's top secret. I can't show it to anybody. But it's going to change the world, and everybody's going to love it. Well. I've just seen too many companies here in Austin raise 30, 40 million dollars of venture capital money or whatever, or angel investor money, and because they had a great technology, but they went down the drain because nobody wanted it. Nobody could use it. And it is such a mistake to obsess with technology as the starting point of great ideas. And again, I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm not saying there isn't a place for it. Almost every great entrepreneur uses the latest technology to their full advantage. But they understand that technology only matters when it's of service to people. 
greatest technology company ever built in terms of us really seeing how it all turned out and everything was a company called IBM. Still a great company, but you could see its full rise from the 1920s and 30s up to its peak in the 60s and 70s. And by the 1990s, it was a sick old company. They got real bright guys came in and turned it around. Again, it's a strong company. But I'm really talking about that first arc of its history because companies, they have birth, rise, adolescence, uh, maturity, and then decline in many cases. We study IBM, in the early days, they were working on the mainframe computer, you know, the giant machine. And the mainframe was, the commercial mainframe was uh, pioneered by a company called Univac. And Univac was far and away the number one company in the industry as of, I think it was maybe uh, summer of 1953, give or take. IBM was way behind them, but everybody could see the mainframe was going to become a big deal. And, and big technology companies like General Electric, RCA, Raytheon, they all got into this mainframe, the computer business, Honeywell. They thought, oh, wow, we got to get in this. And all those companies, except for IBM, were led by technologists, by science-oriented people. And they said, we got to make a computer with a faster CPU, a faster brain, to do more millions of calculations per second or hundreds per second, whatever they did back in the 50s. And, 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 uh, and they all started doing that, making a faster computer. And IBM was the only one not run by a technologist. It was run by a salesman, a guy named Thomas Watson Sr., who had learned under a guy named Patterson, perhaps the greatest salesman of all time. And, and, and Watson, he understood the importance of technology. He built some of the greatest labs. And IBM still generates more patents every year than any other American company, even in its old age, you know? He understood the importance of technology, but he didn't ask the technologists so much as he talked to the customers and said, what do you want? And they all said, look, the, the CPU speed is not the bottleneck. The bottleneck is the printer. We can't get the data out of it fast enough. So Watson went to his lab people and said, create the high-speed printer. And they did. And within 18 months, IBM had 60% of the global market for mainframes more than all seven of its giant competing companies combined. And some of those companies were much bigger companies than IBM at that stage. And, and, and they kept that 60% plus market share for the next 20 or 30 years. And, and, and was a hugely profitable company, gen huge cash flow, made stockholders rich, made employees rich, made suppliers rich, enriched the companies they served. It's an amazing thing. But it was based on looking at people, on consumers and their needs. And, and um, uh, later, when they said, what's going to come up next, IBM, they called it the Future Demands Department. Their job was not to guess what the lab, would come out of the lab next. Their job was to estimate what would their customers ask for next. So even in the case of a great technology company, it's about people. And what do people want? Steve Jobs, looking here for this book. Quotes from Steve Jobs. Technology alone is not enough. That it's technology married with liberal arts, married with the humanities, that yields us the result that makes our hearts sing. And our customers' hearts, and our stockholders' hearts, and our employees' hearts, and our suppliers' hearts. It's how technology can be used to serve people. And the best, greatest breakthrough ideas, which often are just combining two ideas that everybody sees every day, everybody hears every day, they just haven't put them together in a new way, associating things that nobody else has put together, new forms of synthesis. The key is people. Will it make their life better? Will they love it when they get it? Now that gets very tricky because in some businesses it's obvious. Well, if you come up with a pill that cures a common cold, ah, you're going to get rich or whatever. <laughs> and, 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 or well, we have this problem in this surgery, if we could just close this gap. Or if we just had faster ATMs in banking. You know, there's some things that are obvious. There are others where you could go out and ask customers, like Watson did. You go ask 100, 200 customers, what would you like to see? And then you do that. But many times it's more subtle. Most of the great breakthrough ideas were not obvious. In fact, I tell my students, if you have an idea and you tell all your friends about it and they all say, that's the greatest idea I ever heard of, I wish I'd thought of that, you probably don't have a good idea. Most great ideas are laughed out of the room. Most people, most great ideas, people don't know they need them. Nobody was walking around uh, the world uh, uh, saying, I can't live another day without Federal Express. How can I ever get by without the personal computer? 
You know, Henry Ford said, if I'd given my customers what they asked for, I would have given them a faster horse. So there are times it can be very tricky to try to extrapolate and figure out what it is people want. My first successful enterprise was called Bookstop. It was the first giant bookstore chain in the United States. And everybody in the publishing and book industry thought I was nuts. But what I saw was there was a toy store called Toys R Us. And they carried a huge selection, a huge variety of products in toys. And they had low prices and people loved it. And I said, well, if they love it in toys, I think they're going to love it in books. Now, we look back on it. And in a world with giant bookstores all over the world now, we say, well, that's obvious, Gary. It's a no-brainer. No. Oh, everybody thought I was nuts. Well, that's different from, toys are different from books. Every excuse I could ever hear, I heard. And I had almost impossible to raise the money to open that company. But I got it raised, and seven years later, it was sold out for $40 million. The thing is, is how do you serve people? How do you make their lives better? And how does it combine with your own passions? And it's usually not where everybody else is looking. I meet so many students. They came into my office and they say, I want to create the next YouTube. I want to create the next Facebook. And they're reaching. They're grabbing at straws. And on the way into my office, they trip over the carpet because the carpet doesn't stay down on the floor. They try to write on the whiteboard and erase it. And it doesn't erase very well. The, the microphone doesn't work. They walk through six or seven hundred million dollar business opportunities and never see them because they're so focused on this thing that's just slightly out of reach. Most great things are right in front of us. My example, James Dyson, the British fellow that makes a vacuum cleaners. He's on the cover of, I think it's Wired Magazine, the current issue. Nobody told him, look, James, a way you can become rich or get great personal satisfaction is creating a better vacuum cleaner. And if he'd gone to all the big vacuum cleaner companies and said, I'm going to create a better vacuum cleaner, they would have just laughed him out of the room. Because they'd say, look, if there's going to be a better vacuum cleaner created, it's going to be created by the Hoover Vacuum Cleaner Company, or the Eureka Company, or the Electrolux Company, or whichever company you talk to. It wasn't going to be some crazy British entrepreneur out working on his own. And today, I'm pretty sure he has beat Hoover. He's the number one seller in the United States. His vacuum sells for more than anybody else. He's gone on to new challenges, a bladeless fan, the automatic hand dryer duty uh, thing he's got going. He's not looking the same place as everybody else. He's looking at basic everyday things. And, uh, and, and the one thought I would add to that, when you think about entrepreneurship and where the opportunities are, I mean, the first thing is there's got to be an opportunity that you love, that you really are passionate about. That's the most important thing. Doesn't matter what field. But within that, if you're looking at different fields, what I see is people are ignoring the service economy. It's too big to ignore. The global economy, when you look at mining and manufacturing and agriculture and all the parts of it, the global economy, global GNP, GDP, whatever statistic you want to look at, as of now, is 71% services. And that's way, way up from 20 years ago. It keeps going up. As we work through the 21st century, you young people, as you create enterprises for profit or not for profit, the biggest opportunities are in services. And we need innovation in hospitals. We need innovation in universities. We need innovation in government. We desperately need good leadership and innovation in financial services. We need better retail stores. We need innovation in transportation, innovation in utilities. These are fields that are so important to our future. In the United States in particular, I focus on the education industry, which is just booming. The University of Phoenix is now the biggest university in the United States, and the man who created it is a billionaire from his crazy ideas to change education in America. Um, so education, financial services, and health care. With an aging baby boom in the United States, health is already huge. It's just going to get bigger. And yet, if you study the history of innovation, get any book about innovation, you will see it's obsessed with computers, with technology, with digital things. And I am not knocking those. Those are important. Don't get me wrong. But in some ways, those are the things of the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. We need innovation in these service industries. An example on the other side of the coin, one of the most important inventions to come out of the United States in the 20th century was the invention of the supermarket. 
an earth-shattering idea, a whole new way of selling goods, of selling merchandise, selling food that lowered the cost of food for everybody. That idea has swept the entire globe. There are supermarkets anywhere you go in the world, and that idea all came out of the United States in the 1930s. There has not been one book written about the history of the supermarket and how they dreamed it up who dreamed it up? It was this guy who gets most of the credit. He worked for a great big grocery store chain and said, look, we should do this whole new way of doing it. And they laughed him out of the room and told him, forget it, it'll never work. And within 10 years, they were all copying him. A guy named Michael Cullen, C-U-L-L-E-N, in Long Island, New York. All sorts of service innovations. If you really look at it, the invention of the convenience store, most of the credit goes to the Thompsons in Dallas. The invention of the fast food a restaurant chain. There were other chains, but the guy who really made it work was this man, Ray Kroc, K-R-O-C, at McDonald's. There are books written about that. Uh, United Parcel Service, Federal Express, Fred Smith. Fred Smith is probably the greatest living, active American entrepreneur in terms of somebody who started a company, still runs a company, it did, I think, $35 billion in sales last year, revolutionized the way stuff travels around the world. Amazing story. If you study in the history of television, people obsess on a guy named Sarnoff. He gave us whatever, color TV and all the scientific stuff with a company called RCA. And he was a great man. But every bit as great, even though he doesn't show as high in most of the ratings, was a guy named Bill Paley, P-A-L-E-Y. He created a company called CBS. He actually bought it as a young man, but he made Columbia Broadcasting System, big US television network. What he gave us was the nightly news, the situation comedy, the soap opera, you may, the TV star. You may laugh at some of these things, but those things will be around with us much, much longer than the NTSC color TV system or the PAL, the PAL color TV system or whatever. These social and cultural innovations are critical, and we need entrepreneurs to be focused on those. So I guess I've talked enough for today. Um, entrepreneurship is about finding something you love to do that makes the world a better place. When you can find those two coming together, that's a sweet spot. And it doesn't matter what field. But I would also encourage you to look around and study innovation in the service economy and think creatively there because the world needs it. So I hope you have a great TEDx in Santiago, Patagonia, and I hope that you enjoy World Entrepreneurship Week. This is Gary Hoover from Austin, Texas. I'll see you later.